This is Agriculture Today. I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. On this 1st of August in 2022, I just wanted to wish my little sister a quick happy 21st birthday. But ahead of us today on this Monday's program, we start with agricultural economist from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins. He joins us for this week's cattle market update where he focuses on the surprising strength and current beef demand. Also ahead, K-State field crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth provides pertinent information regarding treating for grasshoppers, as well as insight into current sorghum pests to be aware of. We end with this week's wildlife segment from K-State wildlife specialist Drew Ricketts. He discusses urban deer populations and control methods. That and more awaits us ahead on Agriculture Today. Agriculture today. We are back now for our weekly cattle market recap. And joining us this week, we have with us Tyler Cousins. He is an ag economist at the Livestock Marketing Information Center. Tyler, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. Absolutely. We're going to start, as we always do for the segment, with our weekly market recap of what we really saw in the last week. So looking specifically at the Dodge City, Kansas feeder cattle report, those three to 600 pound feeder steers sold about three to nine dollars higher than last week. Specifically looking at those uh, 300 pound feeder steers, they sold at 229. This is up about nine dollars from the previous week. The 400 pound feeder steers were 209. That's about nine dollars higher as well. And those 500 pound feeder steers were up about three dollars to about $1.89. The little bit heavier feeder steers, those seven to 800 pounds, were generally lower from a week ago by about seven to uh, about $12 with a price range of 143 to 156. Feeder heifers were mostly lower by about five to eight dollars from last week. Specifically, the 500 to 800 pound categories uh, range from about $1.50 to $1.78. So overall, demand was good for both steers and heifers. Prices sold about steady to slightly higher with compared to the prior week's prices. Now, look, discussing a little bit more on the, the fed cattle side of things, looking at the five area average steer price, USDA reported the negotiated cash price for live steers ranged from about 137 to 142, with an average of about 141. This is similar to about last week's prices. Now on the heifer side of things, prices range from 135 to 138 with an average of 137. That's about a dollar lower than last week. On a dress basis, steers and heifers were 225 to 228. That's about steady with last week's prices. Now switching a little bit more to the box beef side of things, those wholesale values, prices held steady during the week with a trading range of about $2. So this last week prices uh, finished about with an average of 268. That's about a dollar lower than last week. Um, the, the pressure on the price was mainly due to lower values for the chuck, loin, and brisket. Those all declined about 3 to $5 last week. Now the rib, round, and flank finished the week even slightly higher than last week. So that kind of helps support a little bit of that box beef value. So overall, we're still seeing some, some strength in the cattle and beef prices as the uh, cattle on feed and July cattle inventory reports were both price supportive. Finish there with our box beef markets, what we've seen in the last week. But we've been talking about this all summer, it seems like, because it's when we hope demand is highest. But this topic of demand, especially in terms of the beef market, has been a really important theme this summer. It has. You know, it's kind of that component that times can be hard to gauge, but I think it's a component that we have to watch pretty closely. Some of the things that I kind of watch, specifically kind of discussion um, regarding beef production, kind of setting the stage for what's going on with demand here, specifically looking on the slaughter side of things. This first half of 2022 weekly slaughter tracked slightly above a year ago. Now, one of the things I want to point out in 2021 through the first half of the year, that was the highest level we had seen as far as slaughter goes in about a decade. So this higher pace that we're seeing this year highlights just how strong slaughter is going. But I, I think one of the things that has been discussed previously on the program here is just the amount of cow and heifer slaughter that we've been seeing on a weekly basis here. In recent weeks, we're seeing cow and heifer slaughter count for about half of total weekly slaughter. You know, typical levels for this time of year are, are around 45%. So this this above normal trend for more cow and heifer slaughter has been occurring since the start of the year. So it's not something that's more recent. It's been happening for a few months now. And, you know, a lot of this is just is drought driven. You know, producers are having to make decisions about how many cows and heifers to retain for breeding purposes. You know, but on that same note, we also have to look at just weights, what's going on as far as trends for distressed weights with the cattle coming through supply chain and, and through the first half of the year, steer and heifer dress weights, they're tracking about even two slightly above uh, probably last year's levels. You know, this is expected given the strong cattle on feed numbers that we've been seeing through these last few reports. This also indicates that feedlots are also working hard to stay current on their cattle marketings. You know, and packers are also moving cattle through the supply chain 
um, as demand both domestically and foreign is holding strong. There's an economic incentive for the industry to move cattle through the supply chain. So kind of discussion on the slaughter and weight side of things, that leads us to kind of the overall beef production. The strong pace has kept beef production up for the first six months of 2022 with a total of about 17 billion pounds. And this was the highest production level for the first half of the year since 2008, wow. um, so well over a decade. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that that 17 billion pounds of beef production for the first half of the year was also sold at record prices, which we'll discuss here shortly. You mentioned we were going to talk a little bit about that demand now here in terms of the strength we've seen. Can you tell us about some of the numbers you've been tracking? Yeah, so I guess one of the more prominent things that we, we look at as far as beef demand is looking at beef per capita consumption. And so it's a calculation of the amount of beef per person per year. So one of the things I want to clarify on that, beef per capita consumption is not beef demand. Rather, beef per capita consumption is the amount of beef available per person per year. So, for example, last year, beef per capita consumption was 59 pounds per person. This year, beef per capita consumption is expected to be slightly lower by about half a pound to 58 and a half pounds per person. Now, even though 2022 per capita consumption is expected to be lower than last year, it would still be the second highest level in about a decade, only behind 2021's 59 pounds per person. You know, another piece as far as this demand picture goes that often gets looked at is retail feature activity for beef. The report comes from USDA AMS, and they define the feature rate as the amount of sampled stores advertising any reported beef item that week. For example, feature rate activity for retail beef is about 75% in July. So what this means is that 75% of the stores sampled were advertising beef that week. Now, last week, the retail beef feature rate was 77%, so slightly above typical levels. But I think it's, it's good to point out that the feature rate being near typical levels indicates that retailers do not need to actively feature beef as a product, meaning demand is pulling this product through the retail stores. Sure. Um, it's a positive indication for beef demand and consumption. We're kind of in a transition here from the kind of the peak beef demand season around July 4th. And so now we're kind of in that period. We're leading up to the next major grilling holiday of Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Now, leading up to the Labor Day holiday, retail stores typically start to feature more beef in the meat case. So the beef feature rate will likely remain at typical levels around 70 to 75 percent for the next few weeks. But towards the end of August, likely see the beef feature rate uh, increased to about 80%. Typically, the cuts that are featured would be the chuck, round loin, and ground beef. So I think one of the things to keep in mind here is retail prices. You know, and we get that information from USDA's Economic Research Service. And the most recent available data that we have is for the month of June. And in June, retail beef prices were $7.66 per pound. This is up 20 cents per pound from last year. The record price that we have seen for beef was actually occurred in October of 2021, and that was uh, $7.90. But over the last 12 months, we've actually seen beef prices or be above $7 per pound for over a year now. So very strong prices for beef. You know, July prices are expected to remain high based on what we're seeing as far as wholesale prices that have occurred over the last month. Specifically looking at the chuck, round loin, and ground beef, often those uh, grilling cuts that we see. The chuck and the round have both been tracking about even with prices that we saw a year ago. Chuck has been about $3.50 per pound, and the round has been about $2.50 per pound. But on the other hand, we're seeing the loin has is actually higher than it was last year. It's about $9 per pound. That's up about $2 from last year. Now, interestingly, ground beef is also holding very strong, specifically looking at the 90% lean and 50% lean beef prices. 90% lean has been about $2.70 per pound. That's well above typical levels for this time of year, which are usually about $2.20, so about 50 cents higher. 50% lean beef, similar story there. It's about a dollar per pound when it's typically around, we'll say 85 to 90 cents per pound for this time of year. So expect those ground beef prices to remain high based on what we're seeing in those 90 and 50% lean beef prices. So lastly, what we're seeing as far as it goes for kind of this beef price side of things that this inflationary environment that we're, we're living in, coupled with the slowing in herd rebuilding efforts, keep beef prices elevated, but domestic beef demand is, is still holding strong in the face of those challenges. Now, I've had this conversation with others that have covered this segment in the past several weeks. It's at what point does that demand keep holding up? Because like you said, it, it's still at this point, consumers are still purchasing. But at what point do they realize, uh, my budget's constricting a little bit more than I anticipated, and now I have to start making alternative decisions? It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. 
Yes, I agree. I agree. And that's a lot of the discussion that we're having in our office is just what's the tipping point here. I think we've, we would have expected that to occur a little bit sooner, but consumers still seem to be buying their beef. I think they like uh, consuming that at home and they've learned how to cook it. And one of the other things I wanted to lastly discuss here on, on kind of the demand picture side of things that we don't always talk about maybe at length that we should, I think it's a key piece of this demand picture is just foreign demand or, or exports of beef. You know, and why I think this is important is because beef exports, it's from a demand perspective, is that it is a product that will not stay on the domestic market. So what this means is that strong beef exports are price supportive domestically. Now, the most recently available month of beef export data from USDA is only available through the month of May. So through those first five months of this year, beef exports have totaled nearly 1.5 billion pounds. Now that's a, a record pace for the first five months of any year. It is also a 6% increase from the same period last year. What this means is about 10% of US beef production is destined for these export markets. So I think that's an important key is just the pace that we're shipping this and, and the amount. And looking at weekly export data that we have available to us, uh, it's also indicating that June and July export levels are keeping a strong pace. So foreign demand is holding strong, similar to what we're seeing here domestically. Now this record pace of beef exports is being supported by strong shipments to our top three markets of Japan, South Korea, and China. These three markets have accounted for nearly two-thirds of total beef exports this year. So kind of overall, the beef demand picture is looking positive, but the inflationary environment that the U.S. and global economies are facing could prove to be a headwind in the near term. At this same time, available data indicating beef demand is holding strong for U.S. beef, which is a positive sign for the industry. Tyler, we thank you so much for your time and for this update. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Once again, that was Tyler Cousins. He is a agricultural economist from the Livestock Marketing Information Center. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. Today we are back now and we have with us Jeff Whitworth. He's a field crop entomologist here at K-State. And Jeff, before we get into really the heavy duty topic that we're going to cover today, we're going to do a quick PSA. Right now, as we speak, is the time, if you think you need to, to treat grasshoppers. They're still, for the most part, adjacent to the crop fields. They're still in the weedy areas or the grassy areas. They're getting larger. All the ones I saw last week were not quite adults yet. So as you walk through there, they'll fly a little ways, but they go back down. But another week or two, they'll become adults, and they'll scatter out into the crop fields. So if you do decide you needed to treat, now's the time to do it while they're still gathered along the adjacent to the fields in the weedy areas or the grassy areas of the field, especially brome. They're really hitting the brome pretty well. It was pretty dry since we've had the rain. I think a lot of the grass areas overcome the grasshopper feeding, but it's supposed to get hot and dry again for the next 10, 20 days. So just keep that in mind. Sure. And then another PSA you wanted to put out, you've been getting a lot of questions about confusion regarding Japanese beetles and also green June beetles. Yes, the green June beetle and the Japanese beetle adults both look a lot alike. Well, actually, the larvae look a lot alike, but the larvae are in the ground feeding on roots. The adults right now are both out and about in massive amounts, it seems like. They're feeding on fruits, pears, apples. Both the Japanese beetle and the green June beetle adult will feed on those. Then they'll fly out and lay eggs. The difference is the June beetles or the Japanese beetles going to be around for a while. Sometimes they will feed in crops. Sometimes they will feed on leaves of the succulent young soybean plants, and they can cause some defoliation and some concern. Green June beetles and Japanese beetles can feed on corn silks. Mostly we're a little bit past the point where the corn silks are attractive enough to, to attract them to feed. As once they turn brown, they won't feed on them much. But just keep that in mind. Right now, there are uh, lots of adults of both species. They both do about the kind of same thing, but they'll both be going away in another two to three weeks. One of the questions I always get is, how do I control them? You really can't control the adults right now, so it's best to try and control the grubs in another two or three months after the eggs are laid and eggs hatch. Excellent. Well, now that we've got those two PSAs kind of covered here, we'll get into our actual topic today, which is going to be sorghum pests, starting with cinch bugs, potentially? 
Uh, yes, uh, sorghum is right now coming into the pest window, I guess I would say. Chinch bugs have been around since the sorghum was planted, since the weeds started senescing, and we're starting to see more and more of them. In the last month or month and a half, quite a bit of sorghum was replanted along edges of wheat fields that was planted adjacent to uh, the wheat because of the chinch bugs. One of the questions I've been getting is a lot of the sorghum was treated. And when I talk about a seed treatment, I'm talking about an insecticide, not a fungicide, but an insecticide. A lot of it's treated with both, but the insecticide is what will protect it from chinch bugs up to a point. Number one, the chinch bug has to suck a little bit of the juice from the seedling plant in order to get the toxin. So if there's a bunch of them sucking the juice from these seedling plants and the plants are struggling for moisture, they can overcome the plant. Even though the toxin will actually kill the chinch bugs, now as the plants are getting a little larger, we're going through the eggs are hatching of the chinch bugs for the most part. As the eggs hatch, they hatch into really small reddish or pinkish nymphs. They have a little white stripe and there can be hundreds of these nymphs behind the leaf sheath of the plants or around the brace roots in the bottom of the field. Uh, but they'll, they'll feed, they'll suck the juice out of the plant. And as they get a little bit larger, they will turn gray, but they will still have a white stripe. That's a nymph. And then as they get even larger, they'll start developing wings. They'll still suck the juice out of the plant. Remember what I said. They're down below the canopy of the sorghum, behind the leaf sheaths or the brace roots. So what that means, if you do decide you want to put out an insecticide application, number one, you have to go relatively slow and use a lot of gallonage. All of these insecticides are contact insecticides. So that means they have to contact, in this case, the chinch bug. That's that's not easy when you have a pretty good canopy and these insects are all behind the leaf sheaths or, you know, under the brace roots in the plant. So we rarely recommend an insecticide application at this time. They're going to stay there, and then as we go into this next hot and dry period, they're going to be feeding on these plants, plus they're going to be getting a little bit larger, plus more eggs are going to be hatching. So they're going to continue to cause stress on the stalks and the plants. Then we're going to get adults, and as the plants go into the heading stage, they start putting on the berries and the kernels, That's going to be the succulent part of the plant. So these chinch bugs are going to move up to the head, and they will start sucking on the berry or the kernel as those are developing. So they can cause problems because what they're doing is actually reducing the marketable product. So right now, probably for the next three weeks, we're going to have considerable chinch bug feeding on the stalks as the berries start developing or the kernels start developing or the plants start to head out. They're going to move up the plant and start feeding on the berries. Once they get up there, they're a little more easily controlled with an insecticide application. We have on our website, the entomology website, the efficacy trials, we have done some chinch bug efficacy trials while they're in the head feeding, and it, it, the insecticides work pretty well. And remember, these insecticides are only going to be active probably for 7 to 14 days. Then that toxicity is going to wane and, and the chinch bugs are going to still be there and continue to feed. So chinch bugs are going to be a problem from now for the rest of the year. Sure. Of course, there's more pests that have to do with sorghum this time of year, too. One of those being ragworms as well. Yes. A lot of sorghum, at least in the central part of the state, is just getting into the what we call the whirl stage. Let me back up a minute. We looked at a lot of corn also in the last last two weeks, just about every corn ear that we opened up and looked at had a corn earworm. But those are going to mature. They're going to crawl down the plant and they're going to pupate in the soil. So that's going to take four to five to six days. Then they're going to come out as an adult moth. The moth's going to fly around and mate. And then those females are going to go out and lay eggs. And they're going to go to either sorghum or soybeans for the most part, whichever's close by, and whichever's in the attractive stage for that egg deposition. In sorghum, what we worry about is, like I said, if it's in the whirl stage, they will lay eggs. The eggs will hatch. The larvae will crawl down into the whirl, and they'll start feeding. As those leaves grow out, then they look really ragged. That's the term, ragworms. We don't recommend treating at that stage because for three reasons. Number one, the insecticide won't get down into the whirl 
where the insects are. Remember, earlier I said all these insecticides are contact insecticides, so they have to get down into the world where the insect is. Number two, by the time you've noticed the ragged-looking plants, most of the feeding's done. The worm's about finished. They're about mature. They're going to crawl down the plant, and they're going to uh, pupate also. And number three, we've done many studies over the years looking at this ragged damage how that relates to yield reduction, and we can't show any yield reduction. So even though it looks bad visually to the eye, it's not going to impact yield. So those three reasons we don't recommend treating for ragworms or worms in the world. Now, another two weeks, and the plants will start putting out heads. That's what we do worry about because the same insects then, depending upon timing, if they fly out and the plants, the sorghum is just in the flowering stage or prior to the soft dough stage, the moths will lay eggs there. Those larvae will hatch out and they will start feeding on the berries. The rule of thumb is 5% loss per worm per head. So you got two worms, 10%, three worms, 15%. They're, they're easily sampled, but also if you do decide to treat, these larvae, these worms, are right up there in the head, so they're exposed to the insecticide. It's not like they're down in the whirl where they're hidden like they are now in, in whirl stage plants. They're right up there on the berries where generally these contact insecticides make good contact and you usually get good control. Again, there's some considerations because we have sugarcane aphids coming in. Now, I've not seen any yet. I'm sure, they're heading into the state. Ever since 2014, we've had sugarcane aphids. The question is, do I spray for the headworms while they're up there feeding on the marketable product if I might get sugarcane aphids? Because, yeah, I'll kill the headworms, but I will also kill all the beneficials. The beneficials help control sugarcane aphids or in green bugs and all the other aphids we have in, in sorghum. But you got to remember, you're losing 5% or 10% or 15% yield. That's a known loss right there. So you have to take that into consideration. There are some products that are very specific for the uh, army worm and the earworm. But again, those have some problems associated with them, or at least some considerations associated with them that you need to take into consideration also. So we're coming up on the point where we're going to see a lot of whorl feeding, I think, or ragworms. As that grows out, remember, it's going to be another 10 days to two weeks before the plants start heading, and then those worms are going to be around feeding on those berries also. Once again, that was Jeff Whitworth. He's a field crop entomologist here at K-State, giving a few quick PSAs as well as covering sorghum pests. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. is agriculture today we have with us drew ricketts he's our wildlife extension specialist here at k-state so drew thanks for joining us yeah thanks for having me samantha absolutely and today we're going to be covering urban deer populations urban deer are one of these issues that are pretty complicated because overabundant deer can cause quite a few problems but folks also enjoy seeing deer in their backyard and we end up with competing interests on different sides of the issue this was a major issue 10 years ago. Yeah, around 10 years ago, Shawnee Mission Park in Kansas City had deer densities that were around 200 deer per square mile, wow. which is about eight times what we would expect to see in the most abundant areas of deer naturally in our state. You mentioned there's some contrast. It's cool to see them, but they pose some risks. They do, yeah. So deer vehicle collisions are one risk, and of course that's a property damage issue, but it's also an injury issue. Then we have tick-borne pathogens, and ticks tend to be more abundant in areas where deer are more abundant, and it's also more likely that the ticks are going to have those pathogens in the areas where there are lots of deer as well final issue that the deer would cause would be damaging vegetation. And that can be native vegetation in green spaces, but it can also be expensive plants that folks have in their yards that they don't want to be damaged. 
Absolutely. So while it's nice to look out your window and see one, it might not be so nice when you notice they've been munching on your garden. Exactly. To combat that issue, at the time I understand there was some culling that was done. Yeah, so there was some cooperation between the state and the city, and they ended up hiring a contractor who then trained some sharpshooters who culled deer in Shawnee Mission Park to reduce those densities. You mentioned that it was a successful operation, this culling method, but up until this point, we've kind of seen those numbers return to what they once were almost. Sure. I, I don't have the exact numbers right now, but deer densities are increasing in some of our urban areas. And so that has some folks starting to think about what the best options are to deal with those urban deer issues. And it's not just a, a Kansas problem. Urban areas across the country are dealing with overabundant deer in those areas. So it's a, something we're researching nationwide. You mentioned that research, and you've brought two research studies that have been done in the last year to talk about. So tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so some of the main research fronts right now are looking at some non-lethal options, sterilization mainly for reducing reproduction in these overabundant deer populations. One of these studies looked at ovaryectomy, so actually removing the ovaries and permanently sterilizing the females. The other study looked at the effectiveness and the cost of using gonicon, which is an immunocontraceptive, so basically birth control on these white-tailed deer, and they compared that to culling to see how effective and expensive the two methods were. But some of these studies have shown that they might not be as effective and way more expensive. So the ovaryectomy study, over a couple of years, they saw a 45% population reduction across a very wide geographic area, many different cities, at a cost of about $1,200 on average per deer. The study that was looking at the effectiveness and cost of gonicon discovered that they had to administer the drug twice to get an 86% reduction in pregnancy rates in the does that were treated. And the average cost was about $2,100 per deer. They compared that to culling, and the average cost for culling was about $540 per deer. So half the price, basically, of doing an ovaryectomy and a quarter of the price of administering gonicon twice. Some things to keep in mind for sure. Like you said, different values, different things of importance to different people, but definitely worth noting. It is for sure. Sometimes a problem also opens up a new opportunity, right? And we have very successful urban archery hunting program in the greater Kansas City area. And from other studies around the country, we see that we can have up to a 45% population reduction per year and then a sustained population level managed throughout the preceding years through these managed archery hunts. I know that this is all regulated by the government. So if if people are listening and they're wanting to contact representatives, maybe, is this something that they can do? Yeah, so I would encourage reaching out to your local officials, so city councils, mayors, those sorts of things. Also, your wildlife and parks commissioners would be great folks to reach out to about this as well. And between those two groups, you're going to be able to have your voice heard and express your opinions about urban archery hunts or whatever other management practices you might like to be considered for overabundant deer populations in urban areas. Once again, that was Drew Ricketts. He's our wildlife extension specialist here at K-State covering urban deer populations. We'll be back with more tomorrow on Agriculture Today.